Hello and welcome to EPA's Green Scene, an environmental podcast you can take with you. I'm Anesta Jones of the Office of Public Affairs. Spring is the time of year when many people shop for pesticide products to use in their homes and on their lawns and gardens. The good news for consumers and the environment is that there are greener, reduced risk pesticides on the market to control pests. Green gardening, however, requires planning carefully and taking action early to prevent pest infestations. Joining me today to talk about safer and greener pest management is Tom Brennan of EPA's Office of Pesticide Programs. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks, it's great to be here to talk about such a fun topic. Let's start with the benefits. What is EPA's role in promoting healthy lawns and landscapes? Well, there are a lot of benefits to healthy lawns and landscapes. I mean, first, it's, it's a great hobby that millions of Americans, including myself, enjoy very much. And it's an opportunity to get out in the yard and do a little stress relief, get a little exercise. And healthy landscapes can increase your property value and your community appeal. And studies have shown that um, work environments that are properly landscaped actually increase productivity, which is nice. Um, in addition, there's a lot of environmental benefits from these uh, landscapes as well, including being a home for uh, different kinds of wildlife and a great habitat for uh, birds and backyard critters. And um, also, uh, urban and suburban centers often uh, hold a lot of heat in the summertime with their impervious surfaces like streets and buildings and driveways and parking lots. And uh, these landscapes can be a buffer to those heat problems. And uh, that can often show during summer thunderstorms where warm water will go into surface waters and can be uh, quite detrimental to the aquatic environment. So healthy lawns, you know, they sequester carbon and it's, it's good for the air and the water and it's good for your property values. At the EPA, we have a partnership program called the Pesticide Environmental Stewardship Program. And with that program, we partner with major users of pesticides like the pest control industry or even the golf industry and, and try to uh, find people who are using these products in lawns and landscaping and promote healthy choices with the integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is not really a method or a product, it's more like a technique or a decision logic for making good choices with IPM. Um, some of our partners include the National Pest Management Association, and that group represents um, pest control operators and the kinds of people that would come to your house when you had a pest problem. Um, includes uh, Golf Course Superintendents Association of America. And um, they represent superintendents who have a lot of choices to make about their inputs on golf courses. And it also, we have partners with um, the IPM Institute of North America. And that group educates consumers on how to choose integrated pest management. And finally, um, uh, the Audubon International, which is an organization dedicated to promoting uh, wildlife opportunities in communities and golf courses. So we're really proud of our partnerships and we got a, a great roster of partners. What happens if a consumer, like you and I, mm -hmm. decide they want to go the green route in getting yes. rid of pests? What should they do? At the Office of Pesticide Programs, we register all of the pesticides that are made available to the public. So by law, we're not allowed to recommend any one product over another. Mm -hmm. But we do like to recommend integrated pest management as a philosophy for addressing your pest problems at your house. And the first step of that really is a concept of having a threshold. So Anesta, one ant will not ruin a picnic. You know that. <laughs> so you gotta have the concept of when you even need to bother to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a beautiful lawn and you have a little bit of clover in your front yard, I mean, for some people that won't be that big a deal. Now everyone has to make their own choice of what they're gonna tolerate and, and what their threshold is, but understanding that for you is really the right first step. Next, you really need to monitor the potential pest problems and try to identify what pests you have um, if you need help with that, and it's not always easy when you're looking at, you know, at bugs and insects, but if you need help with that, you can check with your local garden center for advice. The third part is really one of the most important parts, and that's prevention. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that even in a really well-maintained uh, house and space, that there are a lot of opportunities for pests to enter into your home environment. Um, around the windows, maybe you haven't properly used caulking, or doors with door sweeps that don't quite touch the ground. I mean. Uh, Ants and mice and other things you don't want in your house can come through remarkably small spaces. Mm -hmm. So doing a good uh, search of your property and trying to understand where the pest opportunities is is really smart. 
And then finally, if you are going to use pesticides, it's really important that um, you, you read the label and understand how to use the product and that you also um, apply some common sense as well. For instance, if you had an ant problem that you wanted to treat and you're able to see you have one or two ant hills in your backyard, you wouldn't have to spray the whole yard. You could just spot treat right where the problem is and um, that would have less of an environmental footprint and it would take care of the job. Are these just best practices that you only can use in your home? Well, they're useful at the home, but of course you can use these in parks, at golf courses, at schools, and office buildings. These same techniques are transferable over a lot of different fields. Speaking of ants, as it gets warmer outside, you're noticing them more. They're more annoying. <laughs> How can people get rid of pests in a safe and effective way? Yeah, this is definitely the time of year when ants are trying to get in your house and, and other critters are getting more active. Um, ants are usually pretty easy because ants go in straight lines, they're looking for food and water, and they're taking it back to their mound. So um, knowing that, if you see an ant in your kitchen rather than just spray them, I mean a little bit of detective work will tell you a lot. Um, they're probably coming in under a door or through a window crack, so, and, uh, so finding where they're coming in is important. And if you know that they're looking for food and water, um, taking care of that around your kitchen so you're not leaving food and water out is a great way to handle it. Um, one way someone told it to me was, if you have a pet, mm -hmm. you give it food and water. If you have a pest and you're providing food and water, you're actually inviting this ant in like it's welcome in your house, just like a pet. Mm -hmm. So um, take care of the food and water. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some other things you can do besides uh, prevention is when if you do decide to use a, a chemical treatment for uh, whatever reason let's say you want to you have a cockroach problem in your kitchen and you want to take care of it mm -hmm. um, choosing things like baits versus sprays might be a wise first choice because mm -hmm. they're probably minimize exposure and they're still pretty effective mm -hmm. so even within using pesticides you, you really have to do the right things mm -hmm. like always read the label first on a pesticide mm -hmm. I mean you've spent the money to buy the product you've identified a problem you want it to work the label will have instructions on, on how it works and how much you're supposed to use. I mean, plus you, you want to be safe around your house, you know, for yourself and for those of us that have kids and pets and, and our property, we want to do it correctly. Mm -hmm. So reading the label first is an absolute must first step before you use any chemical. Tom, let's go outside. The weather's nice. Everyone wants a green lawn and a healthy flower garden. Can they do this using organic type practices? Yeah, it seems like everyone's going green these days. Even the Obamas, one of our newest neighbors here in D.C., they started an organic garden at the White House. And that's been fun. It's gotten a lot of press, and I'm sure they'll get a lot of good food. Uh, and a lot of people really, organics is associated with food production. But I think those same techniques have some transferability over to um, gardens and, and landscapes. One way to know you're buying an organic product is to make sure it's been, uh, has a logo on the label of the National Organic Program, which is from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or uh, the OMRI Institute, which is the Organic Materials Review Institute. So if it has those logos, you know you're buying organic. But there's still other things you can do that are green that aren't organic. Um, one of the best things you can do is build soil health. Um, soil is really the foundation of of all the plant growing, and healthy soil is going to equal health, healthy plants and less pest pressure. You can do this with mulch and proper mulching and, and compost. And also a lot, of, uh, a lot of suburban and urban yards are really compacted. And uh, breaking that up, I highly recommend, if you haven't done it in a couple years, aerate your lawn. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a great way to let uh, more oxygen into the soil and to loosen it up and have it hold water better. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a, one great way to do it. Um, in addition to that, um, picking plants that match your environment is really critical. Um, in my house, I have a combination of some things that are very sunny and some that are shady. And, and matching plants to those environments is really important. And uh, some people even try to go with native plants. You know, and this country is so broad. We have desert scapes. We have subtropical and temperate areas. There's so much diversity. And one of the newest trends is to have your yard match the environment and to use local plants and local styles. And it can, be, it can be very pretty. And if someone's thinking about starting over and doing something different, I, I would recommend they look into that. Let's say a consumer wants to forego doing this themselves yes. and they want to hire a company that has um, green practices. What should they look for as a consumer and what should the company tell them? Well, they should definitely be asking a lot of questions. I mean, get engaged in the process and really um, work closely with the technician that comes out. 
Um, some of the things you should ask them right up front is if they use integrated pest management practices. That's becoming much more common and um, those practices help lead to uh, the appropriate amount of chemical use by replacing it with uh, common sense and some, some things you can do to prevent pests from moving in the first place. So feel empowered to ask questions. Uh, talk to the person about what they're seeing at your yard mm -hmm. and the choices that they're making. Uh, find out if there are other things you can do besides chemical approaches to deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. Educate yourself on, on how to solve it. And then finally, if they do uh, recommend the pesticide treatment, find out what the pesticide is, ask questions, ask about exposure uh, to you and your family and your pets, and just get some good advice. Tom, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Now we all can practice green and safe practices around the home and in the garden. For more information on EPA's integrated pest management and pesticide programs, go to www.epa.gov/pesticides. See you next time on Green Scene.